Alrighty, so this is going to be a recording of a presentation that I did, let's see, I think it was yesterday, and it didn't record while I was giving it, so I thought I would just redo it and uh, get a recording going of how to monetize your book, particularly uh, for nonfiction authors. So if you um, are a nonfiction author, if you're writing business books, if you're writing psychology books, if you're maybe even memoir, I would say too, um, this is definitely going to benefit you. So again, this is for nonfiction books specifically on how to monetize your book. So let's just go on ahead and get right into it. So a little bit about me. That's me in that picture, if you couldn't guess. <laughs> I'm a number one Amazon bestselling author of the book, The Finer Things Club, which is a memoir about my book which is a memoir about my experience living and working in Yellowstone National Park as a housekeeper. I was about 20 years old, 20, 20 and 21 years old. I was working for two summers there. So this was my first book. It came out last year, number one on Amazon. I am a former book launcher for an Inc. 5000 company, helping to launch C-suite executives, business leaders, thought leaders, etc. And now I make it my mission to not only educate authors, uh, and authorpreneurs on the book business, but I also act as a, a strategist and consultant for those who are wanting to get a little more attention on their brand and their book, uh, particularly for nonfiction authors. So I'm a nonfiction girly, as you can tell. And I've also been featured in magazines like Lux Lifestyle and uh, KD Hamptons. So that's a little bit about me. But really, the big mission that I'm on is to educate and empower authors by creating these open and transparent conversations around the business of books, especially just because it tends to be very confusing for folks who are deciding that they want to write a book, for people who maybe aren't as familiar with it, for folks who haven't worked in it before, um, just kind of educating them on the things that they don't know. And monetizing your books is one of those items. So this is kind of what I have planned for our time together. We're going to be doing a bit of an overview, diving a little bit into some monetization strategies, because I know that that's what you're really here for, talking about how that fits into the bigger picture with marketing and promotion. At the time, there was going to be some networking, but since it's just you and me, there's not really any need for that. Although you can put your information down below in the comments if you'd like, and then I'm um, wrapping things up. So that's kind of what I have in place. Let's go ahead and get right into it. So what's, what's important to know about this presentation is that this is not a get rich quick scheme or structure, but it's definitely one that's meant to be buildable over time. Taking baby steps, building the small, the small snowball so it starts to roll on its own and kind of pick up speed naturally, right? This is meant to be very buildable things that you are intentionally, you're, you're covering the foundational elements so that you can intentionally build on top of it, if that makes any sense. So as we start going over some of these strategies, you'll kind of get a better idea of what I'm talking about. But I did want to highlight that this is nothing about getting rich quick. Don't write books for the money. Money is, money is a side effect of writing a really great book. Which brings me well into the next slide. Books don't make money unless three things happen. The first one being that you know what your unique selling point is. This basically translates to what's unique about your book. What's unique about your approach, your solution, your story, if you're a memoir, what is it that is worth paying attention to? Why, basically, should anyone care about your book? Because people will not, unless they know you and like you and trust you, people will not inherently care about your book as a communicator, as a writer, as an author, it's your job to get people to care. It's bringing people from maybe uh, maybe apathy, let's say, apathy to curiosity. That's the kind of conversion that we want with any kind of story that we're telling. Stories get people to care because they're told in story formats. So knowing what your unique selling point is. Knowing who specifically could benefit from that unique point or the story or the perspective or approach or solution that you have to share. Because these are the people who are going to be not only buying your books, but converting into, let's say, community members or people who are going to start checking out your website or wanting to engage with you on social media or go to any in-person events or anything that you want to do. So knowing specifically who your target audience is with your book. And finally, using your book as a tool for something else. Your book is a bite-sized nugget of a bigger vision that you're creating for yourself. And that's basically what your brand is. And I'm going to be getting into that a little bit later too. But these are some of the three major points that I did want to talk about when it comes to monetizing. Knowing what's special about your book and why people should care, who's going to care about it, and using it as a tool for a bigger experience or a deeper experience. 
So <laughs> what do you think the purpose of a nonfiction book is? Everyone's going to have a different response. A lot of people, one person said the other day that it was about sharing their particular point of view, sharing their particular story, how they addressed a particular challenge, which definitely is true and is for sure a unique a, a unique part of writing a memoir, especially. But I would also say, generally for nonfiction, it's that you're offering a new or unique perspective or solution. People like originality, people like authenticity, they like new and unique answers to common problems, right? So generally speaking, especially if it's told in the form of a story based on your own experience, that's kind of a nice way to sort of package this up, right? So basically you're communicating how you addressed a challenge through a particular approach, perspective, or solution. And memoir. Memoir is he heavily narrative, so a lot of the emphasis is going to rest in the story and how you approached a particular challenge. So what's really important to know, this is good contextual information to know before diving into nonfiction or before pursuing a nonfiction book if you're, a, if you're in the writing stages. Historically, nonfiction has been the dominant trade book. Um, pretty much since COVID, we've been in a pretty big fiction space right now because everyone wants to escape reality. Everyone was quarantining, we're at home. We kind of want to get away from reality. So a lot of people have been picking up fiction books over the past few years. But before COVID, um, nonfiction books were, were pretty much the dominant trade book. So 40, almost half of the total copies of print books sold in 2022 were nonfiction. And this was from a pretty recent statistic, a little bit less than a year ago. And one other statistic that I do want to show too, because I'm not all fluff, I try to root or ground anything that I say in numbers and facts, is that out of all the nonfiction categories, child and youth, adult, is by far the biggest category, as you can see by this graph. Nearly 300 million nonfiction adult print books were sold in 2022 as well. And as you can see, there's a pretty big drop off between the 300 million and the 71 million for children's and YA. And again, this is a statistic from a little over a year ago. So I tried to keep them pretty recent. So that's all that I have for the overview. Pretty quick, pretty short and sweet, I hope. Now we're gonna be diving into some of the monetization strategies and there's a lot of information in these slides. So feel free to take notes. Um, I would definitely be taking notes if I were you. <laughs> So as we get into the monetization strategies, there's just a couple quick notes that I want to mention. Um, actually, I'm going to move my picture over here. So I've chunked these into smaller, more digestible efforts and then larger efforts that maybe require a bit more coordination. And the real difference between the two is that the bigger efforts play more into the long game. Smaller is usually more for your book, like kind of, you know, finding ways to monetize off of your book. And then the bigger picture is about using that book as a tool to go for, you know, a bigger experience or a deeper experience that you're wanting to create with your budding audience or with your growing community. So just wanted to let you know that that's kind of how I chunked this information. So the first one that we're going to be talking about is self-publishing. Self-publishing has been a huge, huge, huge trend for the past I don't know, I would say, I don't know, f decade maybe, especially in recent years, um, especially in the last five years or so, but I would say about between the last five or 10 years, self-publishing has really picked up and there's a reason for this. A lot of it is because um, if you self-publish, you're gonna reap majority of the royalties, generally speaking, versus maybe traditional publishing, going with a small press or a large press. Um, if you decide to self-publish, the, the commission rate or the royalty range is going to average between about 35% and 70% versus tr uh, traditionally publishing, which is how historically people have gotten books out. That's like what you think of when you think of a book deal, when you think of you know, a large advance that's usually through a traditional publishing deal. Yeah, the royalties are going to average about 10 or 15 percent. In past videos, I've said that it maxes out at 10 percent generally, but as I'm doing more research and I'm learning more about the book business because I'm constantly learning about the book business, um, I did want to kind of modify what I've said before and say that there is a range of about 10 to 15 percent or so. And this is also from a pretty recent statistic just a few months ago. The other unique point about self-publishing is that if you do it because you're self-publishing or independently publishing, there's no contracts to sign. Therefore, you're going to keep 100% of the rights to your book, meaning you can kind of do whatever you want with it. <laughs> and um, those of you who are watching, if you disagree with what I have to say or I maybe um, am misrepresenting something, definitely feel free to let me know in the comments below. 
um, if you maybe know something that I don't or if I'm misrepresenting something, but generally speaking, these are two of the biggest attractive points when it comes to self-publishing. Finally, topping it off with freedom of creativity. You can do a lot of cool stuff with your book because you're the one making it happen. That's not to say that you shouldn't pay attention to industry standards if you can. I, I know that this presentation is for nonfiction, but if you were writing like a fiction, like a romance book or something, you wouldn't want to have a romance cover that's like in the form of a nonfiction book, right? Like there's certain trends, there's certain design standards for different types of books, different genres of books. Generally, nonfiction books are going to have some kind of white background or, you know, a symbol to, you know, like a physical symbol to represent an abstract idea versus romance, which might have like cartoony looking two dimensional characters, lots of colors, a little bit of cursive. It's just going to vary. So, you know, there's a lot of creative freedom in it, but it's not to say that you shouldn't pay attention to some of those industry standards through different forms of research. Another cool thing is that um, this is especially beneficial if you have a book that's going to be coming out soon within the next four to six months, ideally, depending on how much runway you have, you can play around with some bonus materials. And I did this for my own books, which was pretty cool. So bonus materials are basically additional incentives for people to buy the book. It's just a little, it's like a goodie bag you get when you buy a book, basically. So it's just it's a way to incentivize people to buy copies of their book or to be, or, or maybe even to buy multiple copies of your book. And the cool thing about this, especially if it's nonfiction, is that you are giving away extra value with your book at no additional cost for either you or the reader. Um, the only other costs really that I can think of that would be associated with something like this is if you wanted to build out a website with your book as the domain name and you know, create a landing page or something that talks about where to buy it and what some of those bonuses are. You can do it yourself, you can hire out, but generally that's where I've seen some of these bonus materials be presented is usually on some kind of website format. You could probably do something similar to it on, I don't know, maybe, um, you know, you could advertise this on social media if you wanted to advertise something like this on like a Google website or something and just DIY it yourself, you totally could. Um, but this is kind of a cool way to play around with it. And I have a couple examples that I'm going to be showing as well. So when my book launched last June, these are some of the bonuses that I had. And I think they're still up on my website. My website is thefinerthingsclub.life. So I did purchase a domain that matched my book title, The Finer Things Club. And what's what I would recommend if you're interested in this kind of thing is choosing bonuses that are evergreen that you won't have to keep up with. So a lot of these bonuses are like one and done type things. I made a playlist. I put together a list of books. There's a lot of characters and acronyms in my book, so I made a cheat sheet. And then finally, 16 things that I learned about working in Yellowstone. So these are all like you put it together. You set it up and it's done. You don't have to maintain anything. You don't have to follow up with anything. doesn't mean that you couldn't insert maybe like a coffee hour Q&A or something if you wanted to. That's just something that you'd have to follow up with later. It's a lot of work launching a book or just publishing and writing one in general. So definitely pay attention to your bandwidth, what you're comfortable with. And you can even do something like this. You could do tiered packages if you want. Mine was just buy a book and get all these things. Some people do buy three books, get all these things plus three more. Um, depends on kind of how, you know, how, how much of an emphasis you want to put on book sales. Um, and the point of this really is just to kind of deepen the experience or to kind of provide extra value or give extra answers or give extra support in some kind of way. So again, my book's a memoir, but if you were writing like a leadership book or something, for example, you know, maybe you could put in a couple checklists for what every, le every, every quality every leader should have or something like that. Um, again, you're just providing extra value. And basically how I did this was I created these assets, uploaded them to my Google Drive, linked, uh, took those links from those items and put them into an automated email in my CRM. It could be MailChimp, it could be Constant Contact, HubSpot, whatever. Um, you link it out and create a template so that when someone opts in on this book website, um, their opt-in is going to trigger that email to automatically get sent out that contains links to those items for them to download, to print, to use, whatever. Some people do toolkits, some people do workbooks, some people do all kinds of things. So um, just something to keep in mind um, that you want to set it up to be as automated as possible if you can. And this is an example of what my automated email looked like. This wasn't like verbatim. It's just something that I put together to kind of give you the gist of it. 
And the cool thing too is that if you do this, you're just collecting more emails for your newsletter. If you have a newsletter or something that you wanna send out. So again, thanks for buying my book. Here's the copy of those bonuses. This is what my book is about or what you can expect. Usually with nonfiction, any kind of what you can expect description is gonna include bullet points of specifically what they're going to learn. So you might wanna include something like that if yours is maybe a non-memoir nonfiction book. Um, and then my call to action is if you found value in it or if you read it and liked it, definitely consider leaving a review on Amazon or Goodreads. The more reviews I get, the more people find out about it. And finally, email me if you have any questions or if you want to talk about the book or if the links are giving you any trouble. So pretty short and sweet. People, they're busy. I don't think it needs to be anything fancy. Um, again, it's just meant to kind of deepen the experience a little bit. So one of the other smaller sort of efforts to monetize your book or your brand also includes library programs. And I feel like this is heavily underutilized and I definitely think more people should do this. And the appeal of doing events or programs at libraries, especially if you're a local author, is that they're gonna be very, very receptive to it because you are a local author. Local authors hold a lot of power when it comes to their bookstores, when it comes to their libraries. And people really like meeting people who are local to the area that, you know, are a published author, if they're traditionally published, if they're self-published. And sometimes libraries and bookstores will even have designated areas to kind of feature these books by local authors. So definitely, if, if you don't have much of a relationship with your library, um, and I'm going to be talking about bookstores a bit later, but if you don't have much of a, of a relationship with your library, definitely consider kind of poking your head in, talking with some of the staff, getting to know them in the area and kind of ways that you can support them. Um, that way, when you do have an ask of like, hey, I'd like to put on a program, they're a little more receptive to it. So the way that you could do this is if you have a nonfiction book, extract a little concept nugget. That's basically what I'm calling it. Some kind of teachable nugget, some kind of thing that you're passionate about, something that you wanna bring more light to, something that you wanna highlight. Extract a little something out of your book or even the TLDR version of your book. Create a workshop or a lecture or a presentation or something about what that is, teach that. And then the cool thing is that you can sell copies of your book at the end. And on top of that, sometimes libraries will even pay you to give these kinds of presentations, depending on their budget. Some Every library is a little bit different because every neighborhood is different, right? Um, I have library experience myself and the program librarian that I worked with at the time let me know that on average they would pay our speakers at the library that I worked at about $200 to $400 an hour. So, you know, um, just having those kinds of conversations with your libraries can be pretty enlightening and it can be very rewarding. It's a win-win-win all around because the library is filling the roster with programs, you get more exposure, experience, and maybe sell a few copies and then community members get value and if you're a business owner or an entrepreneur you can maybe even get some clients that way depending on the kind of audience that you're wanting to attract with the event that you're pitching to libraries so libraries are definitely a win-win-win situation all around highly 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 recommend using your libraries they have really good resources all around this is a picture of me <laughs> um what was it probably six months ago i gave my first presentation at my library about three ways to publish a book and um, if you can get videos or pictures of you in action, it's just more credibility, more social proof all around that you can use for other speaking events to pitch yourself. You could put it on your website, you could put it on your social media, include it in your newsletters, X, Y, Z, just a ton of cool. So you can never have too much media when it comes to like presentations and stages or stuff like that. So that was an example. And if anyone is in Illinois too, um, my uh, program librarian colleague of mine said that, uh, she told me about this one, I had no idea about it, but if anyone's in Illinois, um, because I'm based out of Chicago, there's something called the Laconi Help Directory, and it's an acronym for Highly Effective Library Presenters. And if you decide that you wanna do more presentations at libraries, paid or free, maybe your goal is just to sell extra copies or gift books to your libraries, you can sign up, get a little bit of experience and kind of build up your, um, your uh, portfolio a little bit and then you can apply to this and basically it sets you up to be a program event person for other libraries in Illinois to hit you up and basically you know ask hey we really like kind of what it is that you do and the kind of stuff that you talk about would you mind giving a presentation at our library right so this is relatively new I don't have experience with it but I very recently heard about it so I definitely wanted to talk about that. I don't know what the equivalent would be in other states or if other states have something like this. Um, I try to do a little bit of research, but it probably wouldn't hurt to ask your local library or just do a little bit of digging yourself, but I did want to put this out there as a resource. 
I think this might be the last of the smaller efforts, but the last one is bookstore consignment. And I mentioned that I was gonna be talking about bookstores in a little bit, and this is that. So if you're not super familiar with selling your books on consignment to bookstores, it's basically a partnership with um, bookstores in your community. And again, if anyone out there knows more about this than I do, feel free to drop your comments below or suggestions or resources or anything. But you're basically approaching individual bookstores, asking them to carry your book. And if it's successful, if it turns out that they're cool with doing something like that, you can get little cuts from sales that they make, which is kind of cool. Um, generally, I feel like, uh, from what I've heard and what I've researched, these bookstores tend to be a little bit more weary of self-published books just because um, since it is more of like a DIY type of publishing model, there tend to be a lot more errors or maybe the cover design isn't so attractive, maybe versus traditional books or books that are published through small presses or something like that, where you know there are standards and there are experts on the team who kind of you know take care of some of these items. So. You know, doesn't mean that you couldn't do it if you self-published. I would just, you know, it. I guess it just kind of depends on the quality of book, just based on what I've heard and what I've seen. But this is an option for you if you're interested in it. Like I said, sometimes they have a section dedicated to local authors, which is pretty cool. And another benefit of this is that more businesses, more, lo more local businesses know about you and want to support you. Um, libraries know about you, bookstores know about you. If you want to do events at different ones or if you want to host something, because they know you and because you've interacted with them, they'd be a little bit more open to doing something like that. So just something to consider. And the other important note too that I want to highlight is please, please, please do not just walk into a bookstore with copies of your book and expect them to be in store that day. They don't like that. That's like walking into a birthday party uninvited. You just don't want to do something like that. It could be considered rude. So definitely check if there's a particular store or stores that you're interested in working with. Check their websites because more often than not, they're going to have a specific page or section that lists out the guidelines or the criteria for local authors wanting to sell their book on consignment with them or through them, I should say. So this might be hidden under some of the tabs up, up at the top. Maybe they have like a local author section, maybe they have an about us section. Sometimes they might have those, you know, you hover over it and then the menu drops down. Just poke around on their website. If you don't see it in any of those tabs immediately, you can always scroll down to the very bottom and usually in the footer, there's like a little section that says work with us or for local authors or sell your book on consignment. If they don't have anything like that, maybe they don't offer it, um, but it just doesn't hurt to call them up or email them and ask. So that's selling on consignment, oh, derivative series. So if you're not familiar with derivative series, um, this is basically taking a particular concept and curating it for different audiences, and it all rests under one umbrella. Probably one of the best examples is Chicken Soup for the Soul. This was probably the best example that I could think of, and it's just a collection of stories for very particular people, for motivation, for inspiration, for whatever. You have Chicken Soup for the Grieving Soul, you have Chicken Soup for the Teenage Soul, which, by the way, I read this book growing up and I really liked it. For singles, for kids, for work, for America, for pet lovers, there's a different audience for each kind of story, but it's all housed under the Chicken Soup for the Soul series, right? So this would, this is, this is probably the best example that I could think of for like a derivative series. And the reason that a derivative series might not be a bad idea, especially if you're someone who has a topic and you want to talk about it multiple times, um, usually, generally, what I've heard about series, again, I'm a nonfiction person, less fiction, but what I've heard about like fiction series, for example, is that usually one book can kind of help sell the other, right? If, if it's a series, someone buys book one and they really like it, well, they're gonna have to buy book two to find out what happens next. So a derivative series, I don't know, maybe, you know, maybe that's something that would be worth considering if you're someone who wants to talk about something in 10,000 different ways or five different ways, for example. So there is a little bit of potential for each book to kind of help sell the other, depending on who specifically you're targeting, which brings me very well to the second bullet point, which is that each of each, each, book within the series is going to target a specific person or a specific group of people. And the cool thing about this is if you did something like this, is that once you write it once, you've kind of written all the other books. You just might have to tweak some of the details or tweak some of the structure or the outline. But really, once you've written it, you can kind of reuse that same structure over and over for some of those different derivative books. So just something to consider. 
and uh, kind of a cool way of thinking about it. So again, Chicken Soup for the Soul is probably the best example that I could think of. And because this was a live webinar, we had option for questions. Since it's just me talking to my screen, you can drop questions in the comments if you want. <laughs> I'm going to take a quick break, get some water. Hold on a second. Okay, so these are some bigger efforts that we're getting into here. This is like starting to kind of play more into the long game, playing more into the brand. We're starting to shift more from the book to your brand as an author, as an authorpreneur, as a small business owner who happened to write a book, right? So these are examples of bigger ways that you can get paid a little bit more for the stuff that you like to talk about, the stuff that you wrote a book about, the stuff that you're building a brand around. One of those efforts is going to be a paid community. And there's a few different benefits to this or I guess a few different things to know about paid communities is that this is where you're making premium content. This is like the best stuff that you're putting out. This is, sorry, I had to sneeze. This is where you're putting out premium content like blogs, videos, courses that a particular group of people find so valuable that they're willing to give you money for it. That's kind of, I, I think the value that this is, it's like, it has to be so good. People want to pay you for it. People are asking for it. Um, or even if it's something that you anticipate that you could see them asking for, it's definitely something to, to consider. And paid communities are going to attract specific members of your general audience because it is sort of like a filter, like that paywall is going to act as kind of a filter for the people who are going to really, really want to be a part of your brand. This kind of leans a little bit more into the thousand fans theory. I don't know if you've heard about that. Um, but it was this guy who wrote this blog a while ago, like a decade ago or something like that. And his thousands true fans theory is pretty self-explanatory. It's that if you can get a thousand diehard people who just love what you do, they're all for it. They're going to support anything that you put out. They're the ones that you're going to be able to, they're almost kind of like your street team. They're going to be the ones that kind of, they're, they're your amplifiers. They're going to want to talk about you. They're going to be spreading word of mouth about you. They're going to be talking about all the great things that you do. And a paid community, I feel like, kind of supports that theory a little bit. So this is where you're targeting specific people who could benefit from the premium content. And because you're working with both of these things, premium content and a targeted audience, you're basically going to be creating a curated experience through this paid community. You're providing value for, for, for a particular group of people. And I have a couple examples that I wanted to talk about for you know what a paid community can look like. Some examples that I thought of was Patreon, of course. I see a lot of YouTubers using Patreon. Um, musicians use it, artists use it. School, I'm not familiar with school. I haven't ever used school, but I think it's mostly for like courses or for like um, communities of people who are all kind of going for the same goal. I've seen it a lot with like entrepreneurship. And then of course, Substack. I would count Substack as a paid community. If you're not familiar with Substack, I basically think of it as a blog with the distribution of a newsletter and people will sometimes pay you to write. Um, and again, this has to do with premium content, right? So if people really like the stuff that you're talking about, you know, Substack is a way that you can basically get paid for your writing as you're building your audience. Um, oh yeah, that was the other note too, is that um, depending on how far into your book development you are, if you're writing a book, you can integrate something like this into your book. So again, if I were to take, if, if you were going to create a domain based on your book's title, like thegreatestbookever.com, you can say in your book, hey, if you want to get exclusive access to a, this amazing community for free for three months or something, visit thegreatestbookever.com. And then that website could maybe like link you out to all these cool places like Patreon or School or Substack or something like that. So something to consider. It's definitely not out of the question. I've definitely seen people do that before, integrating websites and stuff into the book to further the experience. So another way that you can get paid for your efforts is through online events, sort of like the one that I'm doing right now. You can get paid to do webinars, to do, what is this, workshops, and of course, what was the other one? Masterminds. Mastermind, a lot of money is in master. I've never been to a mastermind before, but I've definitely heard of them. I know what they are. And I'm going to be talking about each of these for a second. So webinars, this is where you can, choose, similar to like library events or lectures or presentations or something like that, you can choose a piece of your book that you would like to educate people on, that you'd like to bring more awareness to, a particular story that you want to share in a lecture style format. And this is sort of where you're acting as teacher and people pay to attend to learn something from you. Alternatively, there's also workshops. This is where you're taking a piece of your book that you want to get more interactive with. You want to have more 
interactive, like hands-on kind of learning. You want people to talk, to engage, to have fun. You kind of want the conversation to sort of carry itself a little bit and not be the one leading the conversation. So workshops are a little more activity-based, and this is kind of where you're providing some of that more hands-on experience. And then finally, Masterminds is just a small collection of like-minded people that are all here to reach the same goal or to discuss shared challenges or to offer support or create some kind of open dialogue around specific topics that a lot of people can relate to. And I've seen these with like yearly price tags. I've seen, I've, I've heard that some masterminds can cost $10,000 plus easily. Um, but usually it has to do with like industry leaders of some kind meeting together. But that doesn't mean that you couldn't make your own version of this if you wanted to. That's kind of the cool thing about making a brand. It's that you get to talk about the stuff that you want to talk about because you know that it's going to benefit someone else. So these are just a few ways that you can get paid for doing online events that it's all based around the stuff that you talk about in your book or based around the kind of work that you do that your book happens to talk about. Some examples of this are Meetup, our Eventbrite, and usually both of those things end up linking out to Zoom anyway. Zoom, I believe, does have webinar capabilities, which is something that might be worth considering if you're interested in doing more online events, getting paid for it, and um, just kind of building a community, a virtual community in that way. We also have coaching and consulting. This is a little bit more of what I do. I use my book as a credibility tool to talk about the business of books and to talk about the things people don't know about books. My whole brand is not about Yellowstone, which is what my book is. My book's about working in Yellowstone. My whole brand isn't about that, even though it could be, but that's just not really where my heart is. But I do like to walk people through and consult them on, you know, how to market their book, how to X, Y, Z, how to use their book to enhance their brand. So some ways that you can do this, if you're already doing some work, is that you can use a book to kind of launch you into more consulting or to launch you into more coaching. Or um, if you already do those things, but you want to kind of pivot into something a little bit new, you could totally do that through the power of a book. So you can do coaching or consulting one-on-one. -on -one. Maybe this is like a limited time thing. Maybe this is like an indefinite thing. You can, there's no right way to kind of have fun with the book in this way. You can do coaching or consulting one-on-one, -on -one, working with people individually on their challenges, on their projects. You can do a group setting. Maybe this is more like development focused, like we're here to get better. We're here to make progress. We're here to support one another. And maybe people want some of that accountability. They want that sense of community. And similar to that, there's also a cohort, and maybe this is more outcome focused, like by the end of this three month cohort, you will have written a book, you know, if you're wanting to like lead some kind of book writing cohort, like write a book in three months or something like that. Um, either way, these latter two are going to be more like community oriented or like account or like group accountability oriented. And it was a little bit hard to think of specific examples for these things, but I did come up with a couple. And people who already do this sort of thing are Liz, Louisa Zhu Zhao. I, I apologize if I mispronounced her name. I've seen her name around. I've read some of her blogs, so I know she kind of talks about coaching and consulting. I recently learned about Firm Learning, which I think is a YouTube channel by an ex McKinsey employee, if I remember correctly. And then finally, Acquisition.com, which is um, a company founded by Alex Hermosi, and I follow him. I really like him. And his is more just like business oriented, like how to build a business, how to make money, how to build a successful business, X, Y, Z. So just something to consider. And finally, the last of the bigger efforts, of course, is speaking. It's a lot easier, I feel like, in theory, I feel like it's a lot easier to get a speaking opportunity if you have a book versus maybe wanting one without writing a book. Because anytime you're doing any kind of public speaking or you know, establishing yourself as an authority in some way, usually a book is going to kind of go along with that, especially for nonfiction. So if you've written a book and you want to get more into speaking, if you want to continue talking on a topic or something that's kind of similar to it or open a larger conversation that's rooted in your book or something, speaking is a really, really great way to do that. And if you can get in with an agency, it can also be very, very lucrative as well. So probably the first thing you're going to think of when you think of speaking is speaking on the stage, right? This is like the TED Talks or the TEDx Talks. This is like, you know, on the main stage at a conference or something like that. So um, if you can, if, if, if you're interested in like joining an agency or getting your foot in the door, if you, you know, I've, I've just heard that getting your foot in the door can be a little bit hard, but if you do and you start to build up your portfolio, some different events will pay pretty good money for, uh, for to, to hire you or someone to speak on stage. 
You can also be a keynote speaker. If you want to be responsible for getting people motivated or inspired that's about a particular topic or to help kick off an event, you know, you could position yourself as a keynote speaker if you wanted to. And then finally, something that I've personally always wanted to do is be a panelist. And if you're afraid of writing a speech, delivering it, memorizing it, you know, being on stage in front of all these people by yourself, you can basically act as a um, expert alongside other experts on stage, all contributing to a conversation about a particular topic. And I've seen this a lot at like writing events and stuff, like writers' conferences. I've been to a fair amount of writers' conferences, but even business conferences, um, panelists is just it's just having a conversation on stage with other people who are in the same kind of line of work as you, or who talk about the same sort of things as you, or are in a similar niche as you. And because each of these can be so different and so diverse in their own way. Um, I only have two resources, and the first one, of course, is Toastmasters. They're a nonprofit, and they have a lot of different um, local and like local chapters and stuff. And it's all free. You can be a member if you want, I believe. But they each have their own like little neighborhood chapters, and you can show up and get feedback on your speaking or on um, you know your presentation in some way through um, folks who are maybe local to the area, same as you. And then finally, one book that I read that I really liked is called One Great Speech by James Marshall Riley. And I think if I remember correctly, this was like one of the very, very few books or, you know, maybe even the only one that talks about how to get into speaking, like how to get into an agency to get paid a lot of money to speak. So I really enjoyed his book. I think it's relatively new too, maybe a couple or a few years old. But those are a couple resources that I did just want to point out that I thought would be beneficial. So uh, we would have questions if we were live, but we're not. <laughs> and before we get started on marketing and promotion, I'm gonna get another sip of water because my mouth is really dry. Okay, so how do all of those individual efforts for monetizing all those different strategies, how do they fit in to the bigger picture when it comes to marketing and promotion? What does it look like under these like bigger umbrellas? Um, so we're gonna be talking about three different examples, I believe. The first one being branding. And I mentioned this a bit earlier on about it's never really just about the book. The book usually contributes to something a little bit bigger than itself. It's contributing to a bigger movement, to a bigger message, to a bigger mission, something like that. Um, so it's, it's never really just about the book. The book is just a bite-sized experience of the larger brand. So that's definitely one of the biggest ways for how a book fits into it. And branding, in my opinion, really is just about three things. What do you want to say? How do you want to say it? And who do you want to say it to? If you're clear on those things, everything else is just going to kind of be a little bit easier to organize underneath that brand. If you know specifically what it is that you're wanting to say and who you're wanting to target specifically with that message. So that's a little bit about brand building. Um, and I think I might have mentioned it. It was a while ago. But if you want to learn more about brand building, I do have another video on how to do that that goes deeper into that. So be sure to check that out after this video if you're interested in that. I'll be sure to uh, link that out. We also have platform building, and some people like the idea of having a platform, other people don't like the idea of having a platform, but it can take a lot of different forms. It can be both virtual and in person. If you feel like you are better equipped to build a, a platform physically, whether that be through library events or bookstore events or having community conversations or going to conferences or giving speeches, if you feel like you're better equipped for that versus maybe posting on TikTok or Instagram or something, then lean more into that. It, I, don't think, I don't think you need to be everywhere all at once, especially if you don't enjoy that kind of thing. Um, I think it's, like I said, I think it's better to start small, figure out what it is that you like, where people are responding to you. Again, for me, it happens to be YouTube. Lean into that and just kind of build up your cohort over there. And then as that starts to grow, maybe other areas will start to grow. So in terms of platform, like I said, this can be virtual, physical, and this can also take the form of features. Now, virtual, you're probably most likely going to know, you're going to have a, like, probably social media is going to be the first thing that comes to mind. It does include social media, but also includes newsletters. It looks like blogs. It looks like content creation. It looks like how many followers or subscribers do I have. Physical looks like lectures, presentations, workshops, maybe even retreats if you really want to go nuts and build a bigger experience or a deeper experience, panels, programs. And then features are kind of 
there's sort of like the sprinkles that kind of go over your brand. This is like a lot of the social proof. This is like what other people have to say about you or about the way that you're being featured. So this could be being featured in journals. This could be traditional media and getting a TV or radio placements. This could be like doing, um, get, uh, contributing to an excerpt or something in a magazine. This could be going on podcasts or being featured on a podcast or doing a guest blog post or something like that. So features are always good to sprinkle throughout your brand because again, it's just social proof and also leveraging other people's platforms as well, which really leads me well into the third slide, which is going to be collaboration. And there's a lot of cool stuff that can come from collaboration, especially because not only do you get to meet new people in this way and get connected with some of the other people that they know, but there's also a lot of room and potential for um, cross promotion and cross a lot of power can come from cross promotion because this is where you are using each other's platforms and each of your respective audiences are now exposed to a new person who does maybe something similar or something that's kind of adjacent to what you do. So it's just good vibes all around and good collaborations happen when you work with folks or have conversations with folks who have shared interests, who maybe have overlaps in your branding and who maybe have more knowledge or more expertise in a particular area or corner of, you know, the bigger niche that you both are in or something as an example. So this could look like um, guest blog posts. Like I said, this could be like um, doing YouTube videos together. This could look like doing webinars or live streams together. This could, this could look like doing a shared presentation together at, at the library or at a bookstore or something. There's just all kinds of fun things that you can do. One thing that I've seen um, some authors do is that when their book launches, sometimes they'll have a live stream with maybe three guests on and they'll just all have separate conversations about different things all relating to their book's content within a one hour time period maybe. Or they'll have three people on and 20 minute segments or 10 people on and three minute segments. It's just, there's no, there's, there's all kinds of cool and creative angles that you can take a collaboration. I don't really think that there's a wrong way to do it as long as there is that element of reciprocity and that you're supporting one another intentionally through shared interest, brand overlap, and sharing each other's expertise. So that was a lot of information. <laughs> I hope you got a lot of good notes, but we talked about the overview, kind of setting the stage for having this conversation. We talked about monetization strategies. We talked about how this fits into larger marketing and promotion efforts. Um, if this were live, we would have a networking opportunity, but since we don't, you can just say who you are in the comments if you want. But that's pretty much all I have. Um, because that was so much information, I have four points to kind of summarize all that's been said. So the first one, this is kind of a good full circle moment, I suppose, which is that it is always better to steadily build over time. It's way easier and way better, and I think even more sustainable to take small baby steps that eventually turn into some of those bigger steps, right? This is like the snowball effect all over again. Um, I think a lot of people are concerned with having a viral moment but when that happens, you have people who know you based on one video that they saw and maybe everything else falls flat for them. Maybe you don't have the content that is similar to the one that went viral, for example. Um, so in that way, maybe, you know, if you had a viral moment, you'd have to like build your way down, realize, oh, I don't really want to be boxed in like, like that, or I don't want to talk about that kind of thing, or I don't have as much engagement as I thought I would. And maybe you'd have to build your way down and then build back the other way that you're wanting to get more recognition for, wanting to be more well known for, if that makes any sense. So it's always better to build slow and steady over time. Buildability, building that foundation is gonna be really, really important, which is a big, big part of the marketing that I like to do. I think um, it's very easy to wanna do those like sprint campaigns or you know, pay $300 for a book campaign or you know, pay money for a feature somewhere when really any kind of project or any kind of larger message or vision or mission or story, it anything worth telling deserves to be told over time, which is why I think building intentionally is so important. And because we're building something that's longer and bigger and a deeper or wider experience, we want to have as much runway as possible to do those things. Now, if you already published a book, but you know that you maybe want to do a second one, Take everything that happened from book one as a learning opportunity and add it to your knowledge base along with this, the presentation that you're watching, and maybe 
you know, contribute both of those things toward book two, or if you're wanting to kind of pivot brands a little bit, or if you're wanting to kind of play around or experiment with some of the other things that you want to be talking about. You just want to have, you want to feel like you have enough time to do all the things that you want to do, especially if you're launching a book. Um, that's really important. And like I said, the book is a piece of the larger picture. The book is not the end all be all. The book is not the sun with your brand orbiting around it. It's the other way around with your brand as the sun and your book orbiting around it. The book is a representation of the bigger brand. And then finally, always, always, always quality. If we're being intentional and authentic and building this thing that's worth building over a long period of, of time and we're willing to play the long game and we're willing to be consistent with it, quality is going to be another really, really big piece of that. You want to create consistent quality and value with anything that you do, whether that be your book, I think especially if it's a book that you're making, but also with your with your bigger vision or with your brand or whatever it is that you're wanting to create more uh to to highlight more or to create a larger experience around so that's pretty much all i have for this presentation i know it was a long one i hope you found value in it um this is my contact information you got my website my instagram my youtube of course and my linkedin um i definitely want to hear from you if you have any thoughts to share otherwise that's all i got um like i said i hope you found value in this and i'll see you in the next video take care until then bye